Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to pick it up here in verse 12 in a moment. This is a doctrinal letter from Paul telling us how we should act and how we should react. And, and um, he has just uh, told us that um, don't go to law against a, another Christian, a true Christian, not somebody that just claims to be a Christian. Um, but somebody, if they're a true Christian, you've got people in your church that are smarter than the courts are, so get you an arbitrator, work it out, and save your money. Because uh, lawyers will rip you, strip you, and the court cost and everything else when the church has its own arbitrators. And then he says, uh, with that, uh, <clears throat> who you should socialize with and who you shouldn't. So we'll pick it up then, if we may, concerning these things. Chapter 6, verse 12, word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, verse 12, All things are lawful unto me, Paul speaking, but all things are not expedient, not, not profitable necessarily. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, I'm not going to develop a habit for anything I can't set to the side. Well, what he's saying here is um, some people might say, uh, well, it's illawful to, to meat that's been dedicated to an idol. You shouldn't, by another religion, you shouldn't eat that. The idol is nothing. The meat is something. There, if, if you're a mature Christian, there's nothing wrong with that meat. Because the idol is a stick or a stone or something else. But, but it is not profitable for you to do it if there is a weak person present that would see you eating something that is uh, dedicated to an idol and, and it, would, it would take them down with lack of understanding. Therefore, he said, I'm, I'm not going to ha have a, a habit that I can't just say, Push her to the side. Don't need it. So, but yet all things are lawful as long as you're obeying God's law. Okay, doesn't matter what some foreign um, input might be. It's still legal and it's lawful by God's word. But it would be very bad if you tempted some beginner. Okay, verse thirteen: meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, that's immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. In other words, <clears throat> understand this. You have two bodies. You have a flesh body and you have a spiritual body. Meat is of the flesh. And the body, the flesh body, is of flesh. They're going to be destroyed. They're not eternal. Only your spiritual body is eternal. So what it's saying is, don't, don't make some big deal out of something that God's going to destroy anyway. It is not eternal. Therefore, uh, you can handle it. You can cut it. Don't, don't farm habits that would keep you in the world rather than in your spiritual body and control. 14, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. That means those spiritual bodies will have eternal life through his power if you earn eternal life. Otherwise, you don't make it. But, but <clears throat> not being caught up in the world, you, you have it made. Why? Because God loves you. It is your spirit body that does overcome. It's not perfect, maybe. That's why we have repentance, so that you repent for your sins and have a fresh start. Therefore, you can serve God joyfully because he's on the throne and you're one of his own. Verse 15, Know ye not that your bodies 
or the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Naturally, you don't. Okay. But what is this members of Christ? We're the many-membered body, and Christ is the head. We are all wired together, so to speak, by the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit gives you unction, guidance, direction, and the Holy Spirit always takes care of you when, when, when you deserve blessings. If you don't deserve them, you won't get them. But God always looks out for his own. And when you are part of that body, and like I said, it would be wonderful if we were all perfect. We're not. But that's what repentance is about. And you serve that body of Christ, which, which really is the true church. The building is not a church. It's the body. It is the people that love the Lord, that serve Him, that obey Him. And, um, and, and so it is. Uh, you you um, conduct yourself. This is why He would have you, as back in verse 9, to be careful who you fellowship with. Okay. Now, ver next verse, please. Verse 16. What? What can we say? Question. Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And that's what two, when they do become one, they become one flesh in the children. And so it is. Verse 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And that is speaking of your spiritual body. You want to be joined to him. And, and what he's saying here, the flesh is not to be concerned about to be overpowering or anything of that nature because really when we get right down to it, it's not your real body. Your real body that is eternal is your spiritual body. And it is your spiritual body that resurrects and is with God in spirit also. Verse 18, flee fornication. You flee immorality. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. He that participates in immorality. Verse 19, what? What can we say then? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Well, you belong to him. God owns all souls. He owns all, you know, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls belong to God. You know, you'll have a lot of people that will say, well, you need to give your soul to God. Sorry, it's too late. He's got it already. Your soul belonged to him before you were ever born. Your soul belonged to him in the first earth age, the day he created you. And he still owns it. So therefore, this is why it is very natural to a true Christian to serve him and to be a part of that body because you're at home there. It, it is a natural surrounding to you and you feel good serving the Lord. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're bought with a price, why? Well, man fails. That old flesh body will take advantage of us sometimes. But the price is Christ's blood on the cross, whereby he, he was crucified, whereby he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. And I'm quoting Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, giving you salvation, whereby you overcome, and your spiritual body, not your flesh body, but your spiritual body inherits eternal life. Why? Because you love him. And because you are a part of that body, which is the many-membered body of Christ. You know, you, you uh, do not socialize. Well, this is why he mentioned those types that you don't socialize with. Because they will pull you away from the teachings of the living God. You do not want to go there. Now we come to chapter 7. And Paul will tell you through this chapter... This is not necessarily commanded of God, but as a pastor 
or as a teacher, I give you my opinion. And he will let you know when it is his opinion he's giving rather than the word of God. And part of it will be the word of God. But he's speaking very plainly about how you get along in flesh bodies with your mate as well as with others. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1. I will teach this as plainly as Paul taught it in the original language. Verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. In other words, we don't know what that letter was. We have a pretty good idea by, by how he answers it. But Paul didn't write the letter, and we don't have a copy of it. Okay. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, you would have to have that letter to know and understand what the sin was that was happening there to understand. Now, first of all, coming out the gate, you know, as the English translation is, you're, you're told to, to marry, to join, to repopulate the earth. Well, what does this mean, do not touch a woman? Well, because you don't understand the original manuscripts. The word touch here simply means to do not overexcite a woman. That means uh, to, to touch her in the sense that she becomes overexcited, and that applies to both, both men and women. Not just women are used here, but it applies also to a woman overexciting a man. Um, it says, don't, don't, don't do that. Verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, immorality, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. You have your own mate, and, um, and, and there you have it. Verse 3, Let the husband render unto the wife due be, be, um, benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. It's equal. You both love each other, you both respect each other, you show kindness to each other and fairness. Verse 4, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his body, but the wife. Why? Why well, you're one flesh. Okay. What, what pleases one should please the other. Therefore, when, when, as it was written way back in the beginning in Genesis, uh, when two are married, you become one flesh. And naturally, that means through children especially. Verse 5, Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not, for your incontinuency. Uh, wh what is it talking about? It means if one of you must go on a long trip, you talk it over with your mate, and you make certain that both of you can wait for that period of time uh, with, without um, cohabiting until the other returns. And you both must be in agreement to that. Otherwise, you don't go. And, and, and so it is. It's with understanding that, um, because if, if, if you go for too long a period, uh, then Satan might tempt one of you. And you don't want to certainly go there. So why, well, what does that mean? Well, you both agree on what, what you're doing. And you know it's something you can handle, that you're dedicated to that. Verse 6. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. In other words, this, is a, this concession is my own idea. It's not the commandment of God now, this one coming. Verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself. What's that? He never married. Okay. But every man hath his proper gift of God. We're all different, in other words. One after this manner and another after that manner. In other words... If you were following Paul at, uh, during this time and place, let's, let's say that Paul had married while he was studying at the feet of Gamiel that he had married a young lady. And <clears throat> then how many times did Paul make it back to Rome? I'm sorry, back to Jerusalem in his lifetime? I mean, only one or two times. So he would have been married and his wife would have been sitting there without a husband. 
So he said, you go on the road with me, it's better off that you don't marry because you cannot promise um, continuancy to that length of time. It's just not natural. <clears throat> so if you're going to follow me on the road, you know, they didn't have television back at that time. They didn't have fast transportation. They didn't have airlines. So therefore, you, it was just better uh, to, to not um, uh, make an agreement with somebody that you couldn't keep. Verse 7, For I would that all men were even as myself. I'm sorry, verse 8, we continue. I say therefore, this is my, I'm saying this, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that they abide even as I. It's just better that you stay that way, okay? And um, especially if you're taking God's word forth. Verse 9, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that means if you don't marry, you're going to burn in hell. That's not what it says. As I said, I'm going to teach this as Paul was teaching it in the manuscripts, not as it's translated to the English. What it says is, <clears throat> if that be your situation, if you can't contain yourself, it's better to marry than to burn up with passion. Because it's just not natural if, if that be your gift, if that be your lot. <clears throat> you're much better off, excuse me, to marry than to burn with passion all the time and be tempted out of your bonnet. Okay, verse 10. And unto the married, I command you not, not I, but the Lord. Now we're going back to what God says. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Better not to. Okay, 11. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. If they're both Christian, they're both going along, that's the best way to have it. Verse 12, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord, this is not a command, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. <clears throat> In other words, he's a Christian, and he's going to raise his children Christian, but he's living with an unbelieving wife, but she does not interfere with his ability or his wish to raise the children Christian or to be Christian himself. You see, the, the problem comes when a mate that's an unbeliever blocks your ability to study God's Word or to live in God's Word or to raise your children in God's Word. That is a no-no. Okay. But it's, 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 it's to be married to an unbeliever as long as they do not interfere and as long as they do not mislead the children, that is fine. What do you do then if they don't? Verse 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, if they get along and if they're happy, and she, he does not interfere with her ability to teach children God's way, let her not leave him. 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Maybe he'll hear a little truth and change as long as he's not a stumbling block to her. Um, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. They're taught the Christian way. <clears throat> They're taught the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that, that can be handled. But why? He says, well, maybe you'll convert the other as long as they're not a stumbling block. 15, listen carefully now. But if the unbelieving depart, they won't have anything to do with it, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. In other words, you're supposed to have peace in your mind and your family and with your children. And if an unbeliever wants to go, do not beg them to stay. That, that is trouble, trouble, trouble. If they want to go, hey, they're out of here. That's whether it's male or female. 
and you will continue to raise those children in, in Christ's way. Uh, but uh, I, I don't care what it is. Some, even some churches go so far as to beg people to stay and not leave the church if they're, if they're a nitpicker and they're ticked off about some minor thing that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Hey, let them go. They're troublemakers. You don't want them around. Don't beg them to stay. You know, a person that likes to beg thorns and heap them upon themselves is a sad sack. Okay. You're supposed to have peace. And you have peace by keeping Christ as the center and let the unbelievers be a, 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 around and, and gone when they interfere with that peace. Because God intends for you to have that peace, and that's peace of mind, whereby you have nothing to worry about other than serving the living God joyfully. Okay. Verse 16, for, um, for what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? 17, but as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. In other words, let, as people wish to do, if they wish to leave, let them go. Get rid of them. <clears throat> but have peace, and let it be ordained in the church and the family, that that peace is prevalent, it's precious. It's the peace of the living God. God is not the author of confusion, but the author of peace. And he brings peace to your very soul. Well, I, I just have a hard time really resting easy with that. I like to, you know, I, I just get nervous and excited. But it's no wonder then. You've got to turn it over to him. God will take care of you. Why? He wants you to have peace. And if someone, when you follow his way, if someone interferes with that, don't worry, God will take care of it. Okay? It may take a little time, but he always gets it done. That's why you turn it over to God and keep your mitts off of it for a while. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 18. If any man called being circumcised, let him not become uncircumcised, is any is any called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. Why? Circumcision, bloodletting, was done away with when Christ was crucified on the cross. Circumcision is no longer ordered by God. It, it is fine if you wish it for uh, hygiene reasons. But circumcision now is of the heart of both male and female, men and women. As cir the circumcision is of the heart by allowing the Holy Spirit into your very being to bring that peace. Don't arg argue over things that were done away with, ordinances that are no longer important. Don't ever let yourself get caught up in that. Verse 19, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God, that is something. Well, what is the commandment of God now about circumcision? It's of your heart, your mind, and it applies to both men and women, to all peoples, that, uh, that you do God's will, that you serve God, that you love Him, and welcome His peace into your being. That's what peace of mind is, is loving Him, following Him, knowing Him. Verse 20, let Every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Don't, don't ever copy another man's gift necessarily. God gives everyone gifts, and they are gifts without recall. You can document that in Romans chapter 11. God gives gifts without repentance. If you're chosen to teach, you try to get away from that, it won't do you any good. God's going to bring you back. He's going to thump your gourd till you get it done. God's gifts are given without repentance. Verse 21, Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. That's fine. Okay. 
but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. In other words, you can still serve the Lord even if you're a slave or a servant. You, you, they, they cannot prevent you from worshiping the, the living God. They don't know whether you are or not. And, um, but naturally, it's better to be free because you are free in him. He's going to see to it. Verse 22, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. You're free in the Lord. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. In other words, in both cases, to serve God is a wonderful, beautiful thing, to serve Christ, to work with him. It's a blessing. It is the forerunner of peace is by discerning spiritual facts, actualities. Not often boom, boom land, but let spiritual facts be determined and uh, assessed by a Christian in spiritual facts. That's how you judge and that's how you discern spiritually. Verse 23 to continue. And verse 23 reads, Ye are brought, bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. You're, you're already paid for. You're bought with a price. Why? Um, God's blood on the cross. Besides that, he owns your soul. He created you. He is your father. And you should be very pleased with that. Verse 24, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Whatever he calls you for or whatever your gift is, be happy with that. Excel in it, whatever it may be. And then God will always move you. Always take the lower seat and he'll raise you to the higher seat. If you work at it, if you have faith and you joyfully, God loves a joyful server. He, he you know, if, if, if you're serving God and you're doing it joyfully, God's going to, do you think God's going to bless you? Or if you feel you're forced to serve God and you do it as a sad sack, I've got to do it. Do you think God's going to bless you? He's not. So get your mind in gear and get it in the right way. It's a joy to have the peace God sends us for being his servant. Verse 25 to continue. Uh, now concerning virgins... I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give judgment. This is my own opinion. As one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. You know that I have the reputation that I am faithful to God that he chose me. So you can count my decision as worthwhile. Verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that this is, a, is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. It, to, to, to love her, and, and um, 27, art thou bound unto a wife? Question. Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. And again, back to the original, as Paul said, you know, if you're going to go on the road, if you're going to serve God, it's better. 28, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall be have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. And th this means that if something happens before the marriage, premarital, then um, if, they, if they marry, there's no sin. It's fine. But um, there could be a little bit of trouble of this, that, and the other. And uh, so it is, 29. But this I say, brethren... The time is short. Life is short. Okay. A lot of people think life is long, long, long. It's not. It's short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Verse 30 to explain. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. And they that buy as though they possess not. Uh, verse 31, And they that use this world 
as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth the way. What he's saying is, this, this is kind of a play on earlier when he said flesh body and meat, they're both going away. We're going in a different dimension in the spirit world, in other words. And if you build yourself up and you're thinking too much in this earth age, you're wasting your time. I'll rephrase that. If you're putting your future, because life is short on this earth, if you're putting all of your future into that short life in this earth age, then you're in a heap of hurt because it's going to pass away. The, this world age is going to pass away and everybody that has put all their stock in this world age, they're going to pass away too. Why? They're not going to make it. You've got to look to the heaven. You've got to look to the Father. You've got to look to the eternity the spirit body and heaven that is coming, the millennium day that approaches, verse 31 to continue, and, and at verse 32 rather. But I would have you without carefulness. In other words, I don't want you to be full of anxiety and all nervous. He that is unmarried careth, careth for the things that belong to the Lord how he may please the Lord. In other words, if you, if you don't, being all tied up in the world can cause you to be so anxious about taking care of family and everything else that you forget about God. So, and, and you can see that point. It's, it's, it's more difficult to please God if you're all anxious. Why? You don't have to be anxious. Why? God's going to take care of you. As long as you're doing your best, as long as you're working, and you're providing for your family, and you can still have plenty of time to serve God. And God will always protect you. Do not be anxious. That's, that, that, that's another word for worry. Don't be a worry wart. God loves you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And serve Him joyfully, not worrying about this and worrying about that. That's doubting God. Don't go there. You want his blessings. He wants you to have peace. Don't be robbed of it. Love him. He'll return that love. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. We have one judge, and he does not need our help. It's our Father. But you do have the right to spiritually discern truth from fiction. And you should discern what you hear and call that that you shouldn't. And so be it, to have peace in God's world. Now, if those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number and you don't need an address. All you need to do is let him know you love him. That's what he wants from you. You don't even have to say it out loud. He's a mind reader. He's a cardio knower. He knows your heart and mind. 
and no one can ever prevent you from talking to him or praying. Uh, they don't even know you're doing it. And he, he so enjoys your love when you give it to him freely and ask his guidance. He'll give it. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. All right, question time. And we'll turn these right side up here. And we got Karen from Florida. I have heard you explain the verses misunderstood about sins passing from your father's generation to your generation. Can you please document again for me with, uh, with that second witness so that my explanation will be factual? Well, I sure will. And, and you always want to go by facts, spiritual facts. It is written in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29, that if the son bites a sour grape, it will not set, if a father bites a sour grape, it will not set the child's teeth on edge. In other words, everybody answers for their own sin. Now, there, there, your second witness to this, if you wish one, is Exodus chapter 20. And the commandment is that those that sin are kind of damned even to the tenth generation, those that hate God. Now, those that hate God is your cue that you have to not read over. In other words, if it was the hundredth generation that hated God, they're still damned. Okay. But the first one out of that generation that begins loving God rather than hating Him breaks that. In other words, it's still an individual thing. I don't care how many people there are, how many generations, as long as you hate God, he's on your case, friend. And uh, all, all you have to do is love him and you break the mold and break out of that lot. Dan from Florida. Noah and his sons, Ham, saw his father's nakedness. Did he sleep with his mother? That is correct. And is it in Strong's Concordance, the Bible, where would I find this? It's God's law. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11. What does Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11 say? It says, to sleep with your father's wife is to uncover your father's nakedness. Ham uncovered his father's nakedness because he slept with with his father's wife and the offspring thereof was Canaan and Noah drove Canaan out of his sight, away, gone. Because it wasn't his child, it was an incestuous, incestuous affair with Ham and his mother. And certainly that's why Canaan was driven away by Noah the father. You, you have a second witness to that fact in Leviticus 18.8, those scriptures are pretty easy to remember. Leviticus 20.11 and Leviticus 18.8 gives you a double witness of what uncovering your father's nakedness is. All you have to do is go by God's word to learn God's facts. Georgia from Texas, Pastor Murray, when the Antichrist is here, can a person use their own money that they have in the bank? With, uh, go without going against God. Question, can you work during that time when the Antichrist is here? Well, the, the, here is your point that you cannot do. You cannot worship him to receive anything. In other words, you're going to, before you can receive his type monies, you're going to have to worship him. You're going to have to pledge allegiance to him. That is a no-no. You cannot do that at any cost. Now, um, what are we allowed to do up to that time? He's coming in prosperously and peacefully. You will have plenty of adequate time to arrange to have material to barter with, where you don't have to sign any paper or worship anybody. If you have like, say, a silver dime. I'm, I'm not talking about a, a coin that's not made out of silver now. I'm talking about an old dime, pre-64, that um, is silver. That's precious metal. 
it'll barter. And a, a silver dime now, uh, what used to be a silver dollar was exactly worth a dollar. Today it's worth about $31. Okay. So a silver dime becomes pretty valuable also. Okay. So that's a tenth of 31. It's, it's over three, do, three or four dollars. That should get you a loaf of bread. Okay. And so you barter and you, you make do. But God's always going to take care of his own where they have plenty and are doing just fine. Uh, Julia from Texas. In the book of Psalms, starting with chapter 119, what does a leaf mean? Okay, the, the 119th Psalm is an acrostic psalm. There are, it has more than one acrostic in it. It has the ten words, uh, which is a different subject for a different time. But each quadrant begins with one of the letters from the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and a leaf happens to be the first letter. It's A. It simply means A. In, in ancient writings, the A was, it meant an ox head. Why? Because it looked like an ox head. It, you can take one of our A's in English and turn it pointing away and, and draw the crossbar a little more that was an ox head. Why? Because it looks like an ox head. That's, that's the way you said ox is a leaf. Okay. And, uh, and it is amazing that the ancient looks very much like the A in English, only the A in English is upright and the leaf is on its side. But um, that, that's the way it goes. Okay. I hope this makes it on the air. It, and it did. And so you got it. Uh, Donna from Florida. I've, I've heard one church describe rapture as the joining with Christ after the Antichrist comes and we fight the tribulation, then the transfiguration, and we meet Jesus in the air. And the second definition is more common. That is that another church where uh, it said you are saved when you get to go meet Jesus in the air while all unsaved battle with Antichrist. Well, because they're both wrong, okay? In, in, in the first place, why don't you read it for yourself from the Bible without worrying about what some church here or some church there teaches? Go to First, first Thessalonians chapter 4, pick it up with verse 13, and what does it say? I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen are. If you believe Christ rose from the dead, then you better know that all those that are asleep or dead in him have risen also. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. They're already gone. Okay. Now, and then at the seventh trump, we who are alive and remain will also meet him uh, after, after we do what he would have us do, we meet him in the air, but it's not atmosphere. The word air there is, um, in, in the Greek, means the breath of life body, okay? Which means your spiritual body. You're changed instantly at the seventh trump, as 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 52 so declares, all right? Don't, don't let churches mess you up in God, always discern from God's Word. Um, this is why you must always check a teacher out, this one or any other. But check them out in God's Word. That's what they're supposed to be teaching, not some quarterly or something else. Joe from Arkansas. Uh, a person has raised an American flag with the face of Mr. Obama uh, where the stars should be. I, I know the implication of, of this evil act. Uh, your thoughts, please, sir. Well, my thoughts are kind of like the vets that showed up there that same day. And the vet said, either you take it down or we do. That's the way I feel about it. It had to come down. Because it's, uh, it is, you know, many of us have shed blood for that flag. I have. 
and we take it very seriously. It's symbolic. It's a standard of this nation free. And when you put somebody's picture to desecrate it, then that is an abomination. Billy from Arkansas, did Jesus as a young boy know he would be growing up to be Jesus Christ? Did he know he was special? Well, of course he did. Uh, uh, Isaiah, you know, he was the living word among us. And what does the word say? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. A virgin shall conceive, shall bear a child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted as God with us. And, and naturally he knew. Why? Because he was God. In that, in that dimension that God would give him as Savior. That was the office of Savior. And, and your documentation for it is when he was 12 years old. He, he uh, went to Jerusalem with his family. And he ended up away from the family down, I mean, right at the head muckety duck of the synagogue and the Sanhedrin. And he was teaching them Bible. He was stressing points of the Bible and they were amazed that this 12 year old could quote and teach God's word the way he was. And how little did they know but before them, in this 12-year-old, they had the Word of God. It became flesh and walked among us. So. Uh, okay, Sarah from Minnesota. Can you explain to me the four horns that scattered Judah and the craftsmen that came to lift their horns against Judah in Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 through 21? What are the horns? The horns are the four hidden dynasties. They're bad. They're the power. Horns are always symbolic of power. And these are the powers of Satan or that he utilizes to deceive people. We call them the four hidden dynasties. What, what that consists of is political, educational, ec the economy, and education. And, and so it is, That's, but most of all, religion. And Satan uses the pulpit to deceive many people. I think if you've ever listened to some people that never quite get around to facts and God's word, you found that out. The carpenters that follow this, and I'm going to say that that's what the craftsmen is what you're calling them, are the ones that fashion the um, the um, procurement or the mending of the four hidden dynasties. And this brings forth the stone that has the seven eyes, which are symbolic of the 7,000 of God's elect. And when you continue on into the fourth chapter, certainly um, you see the two anointed ones, uh, the sons of oil, in the closing verse of chapter 4 of Zechariah which are the two witnesses. Okay, we have, uh, this would be uh, Claudia from Texas. I have a question. Could you please give me the chapter and verse where I can find out where God says, remind me of my promises? I thought it was Matthew chapter 24. Thank you so much. No, 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 not. It's in the Old Testament. You find it in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26. I'll say it again. Isaiah 43, verse 26. God, God knows his promises. He just wants you to remind him so that he knows you've read them and you claim them. And then he can justify you. It means you've done your homework and he's ready to bless you. Joe from Georgia. <clears throat> Reading your Bible, is this good works? Of course it is. It prepares you to be able to help others. And it strengthens your own character and it brings blessings to you. What happens to our home when, when Christ returns? Will it be burned up? N not necessarily. We go to a different dimension. And uh, the dimension of, uh, uh, that the spirit, your spirit body is in. <clears throat> we will have all new homes at that time. In a different dimension, but still right here on earth. 
Linda from Michigan, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the dead in Christ will rise first. Does this mean the people will do, which, which do not hear Jesus? Uh, I'm confused. No, it, it means that um, the dead in Christ have already risen, like I explained just earlier. You'll read it in, in, not in the 16th verse, back up to the 13th verse and pick up the subject so you'll understand what the 16th verse is talking about. Naturally, if those, if Christ rose from the dead and you either believe that or you're not a Christian, okay, then you have to believe that all that are dead or asleep have risen also. Then how can, the, how can those in Christ rise first? Because they're already gone. Okay? It's really very simple. And, uh, but you have to go back to 13, pick up the subject and the object, and it'll all fall right in place for you. Uh, this would be um, Forrest from Kentucky. I have a question. Where, let's, let me see here. I, I really enjoy your teaching. I am an early riser. Your program is, is uh, the reason that I am. Uh, I am your age, also was in Korea. The only fighting that I did was with a guy in my outfit. I don't know what part of Korea you were in, but that wasn't the way I found it to be. Okay, but, but you were fortunate. God bless you for that. I have a question. Where will I be immediately after death? You'll be in paradise. Also, will I be able to know and talk to the grandparents that died before? You will know them. And it is in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 20 through 25, documents that we know our relatives. And those that are on the wrong side of the gulf, we can even help them a little bit. By we can't die, we can't uh, overcome for them, but we can discipline them to get their act together. Uh, Karen Ann from Maryland. What is the one unforgivable sin? Thank you so much for your time. You are so welcome. The one unforgivable sin you will find in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. And it cannot be committed until after the Antichrist appears on earth. That is the sin you're not to pray for somebody to be forgiven for, to intercede for them. That is when one of God's elect refused to stand against Satan as the Antichrist. You refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you. I personally do not think that will happen. I know God's elect pretty well. Their problem is not um, holding their peace. Their, peace. their trouble usually is talking too much. Okay, they, they hate Satan and they're ready to face him. Ron from Oregon, question. When we, get, when we go to heaven, will we know the people by sight that made this life troublesome? And will we have or show our feelings we had then towards them? I think not, but would like to know for sure. Well, read, read Luke chapter 16. We all go to paradise. That's to say the good, the bad, the ugly. Okay. But the good go on one side of paradise, and the bad, the ugly actors, go on the opposite side of paradise, and there is a huge gulf uncrossable between so you will not be able during the time in paradise to talk to them. They can see you and you can see them. But the millennium is when we take names and kick dragon. Okay, That's when we, hopefully, it isn't to condemn them that we will be talking to them in the millennium because it is to save them, to let them know. You know, they also are God's children. Many of them had no opportunity to learn the truth while they were in the flesh body. This is God's way of giving everybody an equal opportunity in a spirit body without the hang up of the flesh to know and see the truth and to overcome. And your job, as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, is to be a priest with Christ for a thousand years. What does a priest do? He teaches. He or she teaches. 
Uh, Bill from Alabama, and uh, this is an old retired police officer. I don't think anyone has asked this question. I have a relative who is very active member of a church that teaches the false flyaway doctrine. I want to give some money to my relative, but I know for a fact she will give 10% to her church if I do. Since I know the truth, there is no rapture and I know my 10% of the money I give to my, to my um, relative will go to her false teaching church. Will I myself be held accountable by the Father according to the, uh, the teachings of John chapter 10? Um, actually, I would be a little more concerned with the teachings in the little epistle of John, the second one just before the book of Revelation, the second epistle of John. If you as much as wish them Godspeed, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. Um, <clears throat> what you would do, Billy, is you would, if you decide to give her the sum, put strings to it. You cannot use it to, as an offering to your church, otherwise you ha she would reject the whole thing. That clears you and hopefully she would not lie to you. Otherwise, God would see to it that it was very hurtful. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. When, when you study his letter, it makes God's day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. <clears throat> Most important, though, listen to me, listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.